becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Comforter, my all in all, here in 
the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the one for singing with us today. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Before we look um, in the scripture, <clears throat> we want to pray for all of the people that are involved in school that starts tomorrow. Now we have here teachers, and this is, this is who we're going to pray for. And we're going to ask you to come to the front in a second. And Dan and Tanner will give each of you a, I don't even really know what it is, a small gift. It may be quite small. But um, at any rate, custodians, bus drivers, teachers, administrators, counselors, so forth, all have an impact and a lasting one. So I want to invite at this time everyone who is going to be meeting kids tomorrow and need a lot of prayer <clears throat> to come to the front. Um, 
Dan and Tanner will hand you the gift, and then we want to have you gathered here, and we'll pray for you as you embark on this new school year tomorrow. So if you'd come to the front. anybody else that doesn't doesn't want to come to the front but <clears throat> God knows who you are <clears throat> let's bow our heads father in heaven we're not exaggerating when we say that these individuals who stand here before us really have a ministry and they will be in contact with other, of course, school teachers and officials and employees and the students. You know, Lord, the day in which we find ourselves in our country. You know the forces that are training every gun they have on our young people. And you know the dangers no one knows them better than you do. I pray, Lord, for every one of these of our congregation who stand here today. Strengthen them each day. Give them grace. They'll need it. Give them coping skills. Give them patience. Give them compassion, kindness, understanding. Give them discernment. I pray, Lord, that you would remind them not only of the responsibility, but of the accompanying presence of your Spirit, the grace and help you will give them. They are, in many ways, the front line in our communities. So I pray that you would grant them grace and help them have um, a shining face. Give them something about them that is different. And I pray that you would bring opportunities to them, maybe private ones, whatever, but that they can have an impact on young lives. Let them go, I pray, tomorrow with a sense as they leave their homes that you are with them. And they are on an, an errand for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can return to your seats. <clears throat> I have a daughter-in-law and two sons that are in the teaching profession, so I'm biased. Um, but they are critically, critically important. And I know that you can't uh, get up in front of a class today and um, take a text and preach and some of the restrictions that we face. But I believe... I believe our teachers are salt that God strategically spreads around and uses as to have an impact. So <clears throat> even though they only work half a year, you know, they get all the, they get all the holidays off, they get all the summers off, we still need to respect them. So <clears throat> my sons who are college professors tell me that things basically have slipped an entire notch meaning maybe two notches the college students now have to be treated almost like junior high students seriously they got to take their phones away from them these are college kids <laughs> um and they have some of the most exotic spellings um, and words uh, the likes of which you've never seen 
Anyway, um, so there are needs there. Scripture I want to look at <clears throat> today uh, is found in the book of Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Isaiah is an indescribable book as far as I'm concerned. I don't have even close to the abilities to plumb its depths. It's considered one of the major prophets. And Isaiah is oft quoted through the New Testament. Jesus quoted it often. Isaiah ministered around, the, around 700 B.C. and maybe into the 600s. He spoke much um, in the first portion. There are so many stark differences in the book between chapters 39, well, really 40, 1 through 39, 40 through 66, that there, are, there were theories that we were introduced to in seminary, we didn't pay much attention to, that there were two, two writers, um, and that it's not a single book. Um, I'm convinced it's a single book. And the scriptures bear witness to its authenticity. Much of the first portions of Isaiah has to deal with, for want of a better word, wrath. God's displeasure, uh, judgment, prophecies of doom, destruction, punishment, not only on Israel, but all the lands around it. And then you have a shift in chapter 40, where it's, things seem sharply different. Comforting, compassionate, forgiving. But that makes sense. God always precedes mercy and kindness and compassion and open arms. He always precedes that with threats of judgment and displeasure. The reason for that is that we don't appreciate mercy and love and kindness and compassion until we recognize how much we don't deserve it. Until we recognize I am a sinner and a rebel in the sight of Almighty God who holds my breath in His hand. And I'm going to go out into eternity and face him. And everything I've said, done, thought is written in his books. And he will judge me on the basis of everything I've done, including Ecclesiastes finishes with every secret thing will be brought into judgment. All that I may have hidden, even from those closest to me, God will judge me. We have to have another way of putting it. We always have to have, and God always structures his message, law first, and then grace. We don't appreciate grace unless we realize our condition of guilty for breaches <clears throat> of God's law and rebellion against Him personally. Till I have a clear sense of that, I don't appreciate it that then God opens His arms and says, but I love you still. Turn unto me, 
Come to me, all you that labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Or the words we'll read here in a moment. A.W. Tozer put it a slightly different way. The gospel, the word gospel means good news. The gospel has to be bad news before it becomes good news. When I realize I am liable to punishment, I am headed for hell, then the news that God yet loves me and holds forth his wounded hands and says, I died for you, come to me. That's good news. But just to come on the scene to moral criminals and tell them you're exonerated, we have no cash bail, it's not your fault, you're a victim, you don't appreciate grace. You don't appreciate grace at all. Until I know I'm lost and I need a savior and a rescuer, only then do I appreciate <clears throat> what God has handed out to me. So if we read through, which I can't, if we read through the earlier chapters, you come on to Isaiah 52, where towards the end of it, he begins to talk about the, the Messiah, the suffering servant, the Savior. And he begins to describe Jesus and the treatment he, re he received and how he said, we, we despised him. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We thought he was judged even by God. Yet he bore our sins. And the Lord, he says, put on him the transgressions of us all. When we, he said, in 53, when we make his sufferings, Jesus, an offering for our sin, he, the Father, will see the sacrifice of the Son and be satisfied means because the penalty for sin was paid by an unblemished Lamb of God, the Son of God, in my place and on my behalf. Now the Father can say, your sins are covered if you put your faith in that atonement and that sacrifice. So he opens up then in chapter 55, especially after showing us the Redeemer and the sacrifice has been made. 55, verse 1. There's only 13 verses here, so we'll read them. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. That's a mention of the Messiah. The, the Messiah coming to the throne of David. Behold, I made him, David, a witness to the peoples, but by reference, the Messiah, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall, be, it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. We need to know the context here. Hopefully that will help us understand the news, the good news that he is speaking here. Isaiah, writing, as I said, around 700 B.C., prophesied that Israel, continually rebellious, stiffening their neck against God all the time, would finally be absolutely destroyed. It happened about 140 or so years later. It happened at the hands of the Babylonians. Isaiah prophesied that. The Babylonians were a country then, but they were not the rising. They weren't the superpower. But he promised, he prophesied, that the Babylonians would become the superpower and that God would use the Babylonians to bring judgment on Israel and carry them off into Babylonian captivity and that they would be in that captivity for 70 years. All of that happened. Every bit of it. And now, looking that many years down the centuries, Isaiah is prophesying what's called the return from exile. Jerusalem, Israel, by Nebuchadnezzar the king was completely flattened. And for it, they had been defeated before and kind of messed up a bit, but they'd never had the devastation that hit them when the king of Babylon came. They ended up tearing down the walls of Jerusalem, burned Solomon's temple, pried the stones off, tore it to the ground, burned every major home, palace, in the whole city of Jerusalem, hauled off everyone into captivity that was left after the slaughter. Anybody that was educated, anybody that was a merchant of any kind of stature, all the leaders, the counselors, the people that were statesmen. And it's, it says that Nebuchadnezzar left the poorest of the people to tend what was left of the gardens and the vineyards after they swept through there and left the place bare. It was such devastation, such slaughter... Terrible, terrible slaughter. The king that was king then, Zedekiah, paid no attention to Jeremiah the prophet. He was writing and preaching when Isaiah's prophecies came to pass. And Jeremiah begged Zedekiah the king, surrender to Babylon so he doesn't wreck the place. God will bring you back. But this judgment is set. 
You're not going to get out of it. He wouldn't listen, and Jeremiah preached to him for 11 years. And he never listened to a word, he said. And finally, when Nebuchadnezzar surrounded the city and people to starve them out and besiege them, Zedekiah was taken captive. All of his sons, the list of heirs that would follow him to the throne, Nebuchadnezzar gathered Zedekiah. He gathered all of his sons. And while he forced Zedekiah to watch, he killed every single one of his sons right in front of Zedekiah's face. Then he poked out both of his eyes. So the last thing he ever remembered was seeing his sons slaughtered in front of him. Israel couldn't ever believe that they could recover from this blow. This wasn't any way. Their country was gone. Everything was destroyed. Their capital was raised clear to the ground. And they're off in this land. And there's literally no hope. They never faced anything even close to that. And it's in that context of utter hopelessness that Isaiah wrote 55, speaking to these people who would be completely without any light. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to rebuild everything. How can that even be? For God, that's not a problem. And so everything in this chapter is designed to encourage faith, encourage return, encourage repentance. This is a great, great chapter. Just, we'll have to kind of look at, look at it in a surface way. But notice the beginning here. <clears throat> Everybody that's thirsty and bankrupt. I don't even have water and I don't have any money it's hopeless come he said and buy interesting they're bankrupt but he said buy and eat for nothing for nothing God's offer can't be bought can't be bought by behavior, can't be bought by some kind of actions we do to placate him and make him like us. He said, I know what you've done. This is free. I can't even describe a God like that. I can't describe a God who, well, as Charles Wesley's hymn, and can it be, And can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? That that God, he said, who we to death pursued should forgive me, die for me, and freely say, I know you're dead broke. I know you're thirsty. You're striving, you're seeking, and you're getting nothing. This is free. <clears throat> Come by without any money. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Then he, after this invitation, <clears throat> invites self-evaluation. Why do you spend money for what doesn't satisfy you? Why do you invest in activities, in ways, philosophies, lifestyles that don't bring you peace and joy and happiness and settled favor from God in your heart? Why do you do that? 
Why spend your money for what isn't even food? And then you can't figure out why you're hungry and why you're thirsty. God always, with his offer, says, now, how's this working out for you? That's really exactly what he's saying. Is striking out on your own, Isaiah, not many chapters from this one, says, all we like sheep have gone astray. And we've turned what? I want you to remember this. We've turned to. Meth, drugs, murder, sex trafficking. No. I suppose there was some of that. But does the average run-of-the-mill lost soul engage in all that? No. God's smart enough to know. And he said, what, what did he say? You've gone astray, you've left the shepherd, and you've turned to what? Horrible stuff. Your own way. I just do my own thing. I don't need God. Oh, I need him when I lose my job and when one of the kids gets real sick and they got a high temperature. And I need him, you know, when things are reversed in some way. <clears throat> but do I need him telling me every day what to do? Do I need him when things are going well? No. Just keep the conveyor belt running of his blessings and his answers to our trivial little prayers. And then, Lord, keep your distance. Stay tame. Kind of mind your own business. Help me when I need it. But don't intrude. That's exactly what Isaiah is saying. I can be perfectly, seemingly righteous, upright, good-standing citizen. I don't have to be behind bars. I don't have to have Scott feed me three meals a day. In fact, you know what? That's bad advertising for the devil. If the devil's smart enough, and often he is, he'd much prefer us to be just living our own way. Not upsetting things, not getting in the blotter, not being arrested for something. Just live your own life as if you don't need God. You've turned, he said, every way but my way. So look at yourself. And I want us to, I want us to just take a moment and think, I know, I don't mean that you're a bunch of phonies, I don't mean that at all, but every single person that we run, run across in the stores and we bump shoulders with, we work with, who knows what's hidden in their heart? What do they really think? What heaviness, grief, heartache, trouble, bondage are they in? Evil are they in? Wickedness secretly? God knows. And he says, how's that working out for you? Then after commanding us to take a look at ourselves, he said, come to me. The emphasis here where he says several times, come to me, listen to me. The emphasis is on me. You've been listening to other things. You've been going other ways. Now it's time to listen, he, God says, to me. I know what I'm talking about. I understand. And I'm the only one that can help you. I'm it. There is no other. Then we look at 6. Verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. That reminds us of something. I know God calls us. He draws us. He's very faithful. 
He visits our heart. He knocks at our heart's door. He bothers our conscience. He is always after us. He never leaves us alone. But there are seasons in our lives when God, after a prolonged period, maybe, of tapping us on the shoulder and calling to us and drawing us to Him, when we resist, we put it off, that God will withdraw. I don't know how many of us have ever really thought of that. But this clearly implies there are times when you can't find God. And I'm convinced that God, after being rebuffed enough times to teach us a lesson and maybe scare us half to death, He'll withdraw. And you don't feel conviction. And your heart doesn't seem to hunger after God. And He doesn't seem near as He has other times to bug me. The more light you have that you resist, the more likely that there are times when He'll withdraw. He's not that automatic. You understand what I mean? It's, oh yeah, whenever I want, I'll call the Lord. No, you won't. We do it when He gives us the opportunity. Seek the Lord while He may be found clearly implies there are times He isn't found. Call upon Him while He's near clearly implies there are times He's not near. In the sense of me sensing Him. He fills the earth. You can't get away from Him. But there are times when he gives you his way. Gives you our way. I don't want to listen to God. I'm okay. I'll quit talking to you. There were a few times, a few times in my life when I was far away from God. Couldn't have had more spiritual light. No way in the world I could have had more spiritual light. And as long as I was still at home, my parents, who were Neanderthals and didn't understand anything, <clears throat> had this old-fashioned, ridiculous notion that if I'm feeding and clothing you, you go to church. My dad, you just always, as long as your feet, that old phrase, as long as your feet are under my table, you'll be there. And so I didn't make any difference. I had to be there. And he... <laughs> He had two subjects he preached on probably 90% of the time. I know I'm exaggerating, but if my siblings were here, they'd, they'd laugh. Hell and entire sanctification. And he could preach on hell like nobody I've ever heard. And that used to just, man, it'd blow my hair back. But it got to where it didn't. It worried me so much that I was becoming so hard-hearted. And you might think I'm, this is crazy, but I, I wasn't a prayer at all. But I prayed, and I asked God. I haven't felt conviction. I haven't felt you tugging at my heart for a long time. Have I sinned away the day of grace? Am I a reprobate? Am I hopeless? I ask God to convict my heart so I knew I still was not without hope. And he did. He did. And you know what I did? Guess I'm okay. Well, okay for at least for now. So I just went on doing what I was doing. I guess I'm not a reprobate. I guess there is still hope for me. My heart's not so hard. 
went on. God was merciful, kept dog on my steps, kept after me. But there become there becomes times when he's not near. Don't do that. The Jewish translation into Aramaic for this section here, it's interesting. It says, seek the Lord while you're still living. Call on him while you're still living. You die, it's too late. Now, I've got to move. How do we seek the Lord? Very simply, seven, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. There's two kinds, two levels, two distinct types of sin there. Wicked, forsake what you're doing. Forsake your way. Unrighteous, unclean, forsake your thoughts. That's down in my heart. That's the inclinations of my heart. That's the deep, unseen, motivational springs of my heart. Out of the heart, the scripture says, come the issues of life. That's how I seek God. Not demanding that He beat a path to my door. He already has. He already has. So what do I do? Turn from my wicked way, forsake my thoughts, and take stock of the fact that my, God said, my thoughts are higher than yours. My ways are different than yours. And He doesn't mean I'm such a lofty thinker you can't understand a lot of what I do, which is true. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's simply saying, the way I live is not the way you live. And my thoughts are righteous and pure and clean and yours aren't. There's that stark difference. Forsake that. And God will open his arms and receive me. And he says, I love this phrase. And he will abundantly pardon. And it it means overflowingly. I don't have to wheedle forgiveness out of God or kindness or mercy and, or welcome back. I'll abundantly receive you. And then the conclusion of the chapter, you'll go out with joy. The, the thorns won't be growing in your heart anymore. But it's the myrtle tree. It's the pine tree. God can even change the soil of your heart. And what it produces. I don't know where people are today here, sitting here. We don't have to worry about the people in town, the people driving by. It's just us. And I don't know where we're at in our own hearts here today. Secretly. Down where only God and me see. But this chapter applies. Call upon him while he's near. Seek him while I can find him. Don't let the opportunities go by. And don't fight God. If I don't know, I don't have any notes today. I didn't plan to zing somebody. That's not my job. And if I ever try that, God won't like it. If something spoke to you today, it's not me. It's not me. I don't know anything. Count it that it's the Holy Spirit poking his finger. Listen. Like he said, listen to me. Seek God. You don't have to do it today, here, coming. We're we're late and I'm going to dismiss. I think sometimes the best place we can do business with God is to enter, as Jesus said, into our closet. Shut the door and speak to God. That I urge you to do. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for the truth of your word. And I just pray today, Lord, for each individual that is in the sanctuary or maybe watching this online, as I know, as our pastor just said, that the Holy Spirit of God is faithful to speak to us. 
May we be faithful to be obedient to whatever it is you lay upon our hearts, Lord. We're going to get up and go from this quiet place. And we're going to go out into the busyness of our lives and in the world. But that doesn't mean you quit talking. That doesn't mean you quit speaking to our hearts. So help us to do this today. In the busyness and the hecticness of our world, as we go about the things we'll do, help us to be a people who listen closely for your word. You tell us, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Help us today to do that. Help us today to simply be obedient to whatever it is you've laid upon our hearts today out of the scripture that we've learned about that was penned so long ago, but yet is so relevant today. Help us. By your grace, Lord, may we leave this place with absolute obedience to whatever it is you've called us to do, because you'll help us do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.